back everyone if you're watching this on Moodle or if you're watching this in YouTube in five years like subscribe comment and all of these things um, and ask questions there are probably dozens of questions and RNA is a very difficult subject so we'll continue for like another 35 40 minutes and then we should be done and you guys are experts in all the different types of RNA that are there and how to measure them so I think think that many of you will have done a course where you extract um, um, RNA, transform it to cDNA and then do a qPCR experiment. So qPCR experiments are really small scale experiments. You generally measure like one or two uh, genes and you can measure them very very accurately. Um, the nice thing is, is that um, have so if you look at a qPCR experiment, uh, the output looks like this. Um, has, so you have cycles. So the cycles are cycles in the uh, uh, PCR. Has, so in every round PCR or in every round the uh, um, the available cDNA is amplified using primers um, and at a certain point it becomes detectable and then um, the earlier a curve comes the more RNA there used to be in the original sample right so if, if you set a certain threshold so for example a threshold of 1.6 and then as soon as the line crosses 1.6 you look at, at which cycle did this happen and then you can compute how much mRNA there used to be in your sample However, this is always done in a relative way because you always use a housekeeper and this is because when you are pipetting you cannot pipe at exact amounts um, so you're always pipetting like um, the gene, you're pipetting in one um, well you're pipetting the gene of interest and in another well you put a housekeeper and these housekeepers are used to standardize relative uh, to the gene that you're interested in. So all values that you get from an mRNA experiment are relative expression values which means that you know that well my gene of interest was expressed 50% of the housekeeper or it was expressed only at 25% of the housekeeper. So it doesn't tell you exactly how many mRNA molecules there were but you get an, an impression of how active a gene was relative to a housekeeper and housekeeper genes are genes that are generally always on. So and no matter which cell type you're looking at, um, the, the housekeeper is there. So those are generally structural proteins uh, which are used um, like um, um, proteins which code for cell wall, right? Every cell has a cell wall, so there always has to be proteins that are making cell wall. So small scale experiments, um, qPCR is the way to go because hey you can measure a single gene very accurately and hey you can measure it across like a wide number of samples and it's relatively cheap compared to using microarrays or sequencing. If we then look at large scale experiments then you are forced to do microarrays which kind of do hundreds or thousands of genes at the same time and you can do RNA sequencing which does the same thing but more or less untargeted so you get the expression of certain genes and you get like reads and these reads then get mapped to the genome. So we'll talk a little bit about it more hey, but in the end what we want to see is for example a picture like this where we have a gene expression right so we have different samples for example B6N, reference mouse, BFMI, Berlin fat mouse, um, then we have maternal B6N and maternal BFMI mice, so mice which had as a mother a B6 or as a mother a BFMI, and then what we are looking at is, is or what we want to see is genes which are different between for example the, the fat mouse and the standard mouse, and then we are interested in, in which genes are for example highly expressed in the fat mouse and very lowly expressed in the B6N mouse, because these genes are target for for example understanding how the mouse becomes fat, but also to understand which uh, substances we might be able to give the fat mouse so that it doesn't become Fat. So hey, you can use it for intervention, but you can also use it to study the, the, the default phenotype. So if we go back to uh, QT, uh, RT-PCR, it is very similar to normal PCR. We will have a lecture about polymerase chain reaction, so that will be lecture number 08 when we talk about primer design and, and PCR. So uh, the qPCR steps are very similar, um, so you design your primers you design for the genome that you want to measure, you design primers for 
for a housekeeping gene, um, which generally you just buy from a company because they're standard. And then you do your PCR reaction with both simultaneously, and then you determine the relative expression of the gene versus the gene of interest, uh, versus your gene of interest versus your housekeeper gene. So you get relative expressions. So if we talk about RNA sequencing, and we won't look too much into microarrays because we already talked about microarrays and they will come back, um, then hey, RNA sequencing is again very similar to DNA sequencing, which we talked about last week. Um, there's only an additional step, or actually three additional steps, and the first additional step is that you have to transform your RNA into cDNA, this is done using reverse transcriptase. So hey, reverse transcriptase is a protein which takes an RNA molecule and then produces a DNA molecule with the um, complementary sequence. Then in the next step you make your cDNA which is single-stranded into double-stranded cDNA and then you add um, single-strand tails and these tails are then used um, in, in DNA sequencing to identify for example your um, your sample because you can sam uh, you can you can sequence multiple different samples at the same time. Yeah, but in the end, after these three steps, it is just DNA sequencing like we discussed last time. So again, here the input uh, and output are just text format files which you can read. So the raw data is stored in FASTQ files, um, and the aligned data is called is stored in, into files which are called SUM files. Um, I think I have, um, yeah, so here's the description how the input FASTQ file looks like. So this is the file that you get from the sequencer. So it has four lines for every read. So the first line starts with an add character um, and is followed by a sequence identifier and an optional description. It has um, raw sequencing letters in the second line. So there it's the ACTG that was determined by the sequencer. The next line is a plus and is optionally followed by the same sequence identifier as the add line, so it's just the, the a repeat. Um, almost always this line is empty. So if you look at this um, FASTQ file here, um, which was uh, one of our own experiments that we did here, hey, you see that first you see an add, then you see the name of the read, so this is HWIST225, um, and then hey, you see the, the sequence, then you see the plus, and of course you can put stuff behind the plus, but almost always it's just an empty line. And then you see here the coding of the quality. So the quality is encoded into single letters. So here this hashtag uh, represents the quality of the N base pair that was read. And of course the N base pair is a very, very bad base pair. Uh, and we see then, for example, a C, which has a quality score of, uh, has a quality encoding of zero and then we see another C which has a quality encoding of six. Right so the third line is a plus character which is optionally followed by the same identifier but almost always this third line is empty and then the fourth line is the quality value of the sequence in line two. It must contain the same number of symbols as the number of base pairs of the read. So every base pair in the read needs to have a quality value assigned to it. So in RNA-seq, reads are aligned to the reference genome, which is based on sequence similarity, allowing for mismatches, just like DNA sequencing. And RNA sequencing allows us to investigate the quality, like which genes are transcribed and how much are they expressed, right? So what is their expression level? But also we can look at the quantity, right? So how much of a certain transcript is expressed. So quality is which gene is expressed, quantity is how much is it expressed, but we can also look at things like S, uh, like single nucleotide polymorphisms, and we can also look at things like insertions and deletions in the mRNA, um, which is for example caused by RNA editing done by snow, um, snow RNAs, right? Because that there can be, uh, the U can be transformed into a phi, um, and uh, we can also see if genetic SNPs on the genome are actually transferred into the RNA or if they are modified. Because it, it happens sometimes that um, the genomic DNA is not a one-to-one -one match with the messenger RNA that is produced because of post-translational um, modifications done by short nuclear RNAs. 
So the uh, RNA-seq analysis is very simple. So we qu acquire our samples, we extract the RNA, we then do this additional step where we transform our RNA into DNA, um, and then we just do DNA sequencing, which gives us a FASTQ file. We trim our reads, which again gives us a new FASTQ file, now with the bad base pairs cut off, like last time. We do alignment, duplicate handling, indel, and then base recalibration, and then the only difference in the bioinformatics analysis comes at the end. So in the end, we are not looking at single nucleotide polymorphisms, but we are generally looking at the expression levels of a gene, which means looking at a gene and then counting how many reads were there for this gene, and then we look at the next gene and we just count how many reads there were for that gene. So how do we visualize RNA-seq data? Well, it's exactly the same as DNA sequencing data. We look at RNA sequencing data using the IGV, which we already talked about last week. So I just wanted to show you an RNA-seq example, which was done in our lab like a couple of years ago. Um, and here we see um, the the kind of brother mouse of the Berlin fat mouse, and this is called the Berlin muscle mouse. So we don't only have fat mice, we also have very muscular mice. Um, yeah, so you can see that this is the standard reference mouse, the black six, and you also see the 866, which is the very muscular mouse, and then we have also different types of muscle mice. So we, we have this, this 866, which is the like beefiest mouse, um, but we also have mice which do have more muscles than a standard mouse, um, but not as much as the, um, the, the big Berlin muscle mouse. So here we see, for example, uh, how RNA-seq data looks. So what you can see here is you see on the top, you see the genome that we're looking at. On the bottom, you see that we're looking here at a gene called myostatin, which is a very well-known regulator of muscle growth. And here you see 806, 816, and 866, right? So the, the really muscular mouse, the medium muscular mouse, and the slightly muscular mouse. And here you see them, uh, see these three again. So what you can see on the top three lines is the, the SNPs. So you see here that, for example, the 866 mouse has a SNP in the second exon of the myostatin gene. Right? It's actually not a SNP, it's a small deletion. If you look here, because you can see that there's a little hole, right? So the muscle mouse doesn't have um, this part of the exon. Right? So the big difference between RNA sequencing and DNA sequencing is very obvious from this picture because you can see that the reads that we get are all exactly on top of the exons and we get no reads on the introns and that is because we're sequencing messenger RNA. So we're sequencing messenger RNA, which has been fully processed, right? So the introns are not in there anymore. So when we do sequencing, we get reads which are exactly aligning onto the exons and we find no read in the introns. And of course, we can see here that, for example, the 806 and the 816, they have some mutations. And so three SNPs um, in and a small deletion here. You can see that from the little dot here. Um, in the in the sequencing read, um, but hey, you can see that there are four mutations in the third exon of myostatin. So these are then in the UTR. So the box here at the bottom, just as an explanation, you see the the five prime UTR. This is the the small so, the small part, and then you see the part which is coding, right? So this is the coding sequence. So exon one has a small five prime UTR. Then it has the coding sequence, um, and then you see that the second exon is just a coding sequence and the third exon has a very small part of the coding sequence as well and then a very long tail uh, which is not translated into proteins. So of course when we look at this we can then say oh that is interesting right so the, the, the really really fat mouse um, if we zoom in onto exon number two hey, we see that this very very fat mouse has a mutation um, like a deletion in this part of the gene, which means that the myostatin protein produced by the 866 mouse is different from the 816 mouse and is different from the 806 mouse because there are a couple of amino acids which are missing here, right? Because there's a deletion in the, in the genome. So had like you can imagine that if there's like nine base pairs which are deleted, then the protein which is produced in this mouse would be three amino acids shorter. So when we look 
oh, when we look very closely we see here that there's this deletion and uh, if you then look at this deletion you get an idea okay so this this myostatin gene which is kind of a break on muscle growth might not be active in the 866 mouse and of course when we look at the other two mice hey, we see that they, they have the same protein so they have a, a functioning break but they have mutations at the end so in this untranslated region and this untranslated region is of course very important in the regulation of how much break is being produced so from this we can learn that had the 866 the very very muscular mouse has a non-functional break so it will just continuously grow muscles without having a feedback from the without having this cell which kind of stops muscle growth while the other two mouse strains do not have this this deletion so they have a functional breaking protein so they have a functional stop but their functional stop is probably having some expression differences it's probably expressed at a lower level compared to the reference mouse strain and we can see that from the deletions here which are in the 5 prime UTR of this myostatin gene right so we 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 can clearly see that the the phenotype of these mice eh, corresponds to what we see in the DNA sequencing data one of them has a broken and the other two have a uh, have a, a difference in expression caused by these four SNPs at the end. All right, so microRNA uh, microarrays. Um, I just want to repeat a little bit. So you have two different types of micro uh, microarrays. One of them is a one-color microarray, which allows you to compare across different studies. Um, you can compensate for batch effects very easily using one-color microarrays, um, but you need two times the amount of microarrays, right? Because it's only one color, so you have one microarray and you can put one sample on there. Often we use two color microarrays when we're doing kind of a case control study. So if we have a study where we're interested in cancer tissue and normal tissue, then we use two color microarrays. We color the cancer tissue, um, for example, red and the normal tissue green. We put both of them on the same microarray and then we get the relative abundance. So we, we, we can see if a gene is higher expressed in the cancer tissue or if a gene is higher expressed in normal tissue. Um, so hey, this is... Um, relative abundance again just like in qPCR um, but of course the problem with two color microarrays is, is that if your if your healthy tissue is not really healthy right then of course you get really weird signals sometimes um, just wanted to remind you guys that microarrays come in in two different forms one of them is a one color microarray which kind of gives you an absolute quantification so it tells you that there was an X amount of pro, uh, an X amount of mRNA, um, while the two color microarrays give you a relative, um, has so kind of like the housekeeper in qPCR. Um, so they are slightly different. We also have microarrays which are not only targeting the exons, but we also nowadays have microarrays which are called tiling arrays, and these are microarrays which literally contain millions and millions of probes, and each of these probes is more or less tiled across the genomic DNA. So we are targeting um, every part of the genome having a probe there. Um, and has, so that means that we have a very high resolution because we can measure every like 50 base pairs of the DNA. And, and we have probes for introns. So we can see if an intron, for example, is by accident being expressed, for example, because uh, there is splicing is not working correctly. Um, yeah, so we can look at splice variants and these kinds of things using microarrays, um, using tiling microarrays. Um, and yeah, generally they do both sides of the DNA strand. So you have a tile which is targeting the forward strand and you have another tile which is targeting the, neck, uh, the backward strand. The big issue of tiling arrays compared to normal microarrays, normal microarrays only target known exons, um, is that of course tiling arrays have a bunch of non-functional probes. Right? If you have a probe which is in the intron, 99% of the time this intron will not be there, right? because um, it's spliced out correctly. And only sometimes will you find that, oh, that's interesting, one of these probes gives me a signal, so I know that in this animal the intron is retained, which means that there's probably a problem with the protein production in this animal. 
So we already saw this slide before. So when we do microarrays, we have to create the arrays, which is done using a TDT file format. Um, we acquire our samples, we extract RNA to the reverse transcriptase. We do some PCR, which is an optional step. We label them Psi3 and Psi5, or Psi3 or Psi5, if we're having a one color microarray. And then everything is just like we talked about before. So we do hybridization, we scan it, we get a really nice big TIFF image, which I showed you in lecture one. Um, we store our data in cell format just because it's it's much smaller than the original TIFF image and then all of the other steps are done in standard text formats um, which is what we like in bioinformatics because you can just open up the file and look at it in a text editor. So when we talk about microarrays, I always have to mention the MIAME, which is the minimum information about microarray experiments. And this is intended to specify all of the information necessary to interpret the results of the experiment unambiguously and to potentially reproduce the experiment. Um, so the MIAME is when we start looking into different databases that are there, which contain microarray data, they actually have this MIAME format um, describing the sample. So have what type of animal is it? How old was it? Um, which tissue did we take? Um, what kind of hybridization protocol did we use? What kind of a microarray? So all of this data, it, it's, it's, um, there, is a, there is a format which you need to use when you want to send microarray data from one group to another group um, so that people can reproduce your microarray experiment. All right, so about now we're switching to more bioinformatics stuff because there is a lot of free microarray data available. So there are two main repositories where you can get free microarray data. And this is really useful because like if you are a student um, and you want to do some um, gene expression analysis and for example imagine that you're really interested in uh, in lung cancer and you say well I, I really want to do some analysis on lung cancer um, but I don't have any money I don't have any funding but I'm still interested in figuring out if there are genes which are for example highly expressed in lung cancer tissue uh, which might be useful as targets for medicine or I just want to know what the difference is between a fat mouse and a lean mouse, right? So you can get all kinds of free microarray data from all kinds of different tissue. So one of the main databases that you can use is the Gene Expression Omnibus, which is um, from the NCBI, so the National Center for Bioinformatics. Um, and this database contains more than 25,000 experiments and you can get around 600,000 microarray data sets for free. Um, they only provide storage and retrieval. So anyone can put their data there and anyone can download the data and use it in their own analysis. Um, and this is one of the bigger databases. Um, if we look at the other competing database, then there's ArrayExpress, which is run by the European Bioinformatics Institute, uh, also called EBI. Um, then this is an archive which contains more than 24,000 experiments. They have around 700,000 arrays, but they have something which is called the Gene Expression Atlas. And this is a subset of all of the data that they have collected over the years, which has been curated and re-annotated by people, which means that this is a very, very valuable core set. So have people went through all of the microarray data that was submitted, and what they do is they look at the data, they check to see if it really is the sample that people said it was, if it's the exact mouse that they said it was, or if it's the same human or the same plant. Um, and this is this is the core set of the gene expression atlas is like a very valuable resource. Just to give you an idea of how valuable of a resource it is, if you want to buy a single microarray, this will cost you in the order of like 50 to $200. So when we are talking about a data set of 700,000 microarrays, this is 700,000 times, well, on average, $125. So there is literally a billion dollar amount so that is just available for free 
um, which is of course amazing that you can get your hands on a billion dollar project without having to spend a cent. Um, the Array Express actually contains, uh, allows you to store and retrieve data, um, but it also provides tools to do analysis. So it has online tools, so you can just go to the website and compare different microarrays and do clustering and create these pictures, which I showed you uh, here, I think. Yeah. So pictures like this you can create can create online um, by their um, um, on on their website. All right, so um, I just wanted to show you guys the, the website. So let's go to um, Gene Expression Omnibus first um, and uh, just search for some data so that you guys know how to do that. Um, so let me get my window open here. Um, so Gene Expression Omnibus. All right, there it is. All right, so. Gene Expression Omnibus is a relatively easy website. You just have a search um, and you can see here the amount of samples that they have um, is 4.7 million. Um, they are 22,000 different, different types of microarrays and there are 164,000 series which are in there and in total there's like 4,000. And so you can just type in any keyword that you're interested in. So you can say, well, I'm interested in, for example, lung cancer. Right, so lung cancer is just a, a search term. Um, you press search and it takes a little while. Uh, you can just click here. So here we, for example, see that there are, yeah, so on the Affymetrix human genome array, um, yeah, so this is human data, um, yeah, so the organism is Homo sapien. Hey, you can see that there are 602 data sets uh, which have been done, 5,000 series, 61 related platforms, and this many samples. So if we just want to drill down a little bit and we want to say, okay, so we want to search for, um, uh, we want to only see humans, um, we can click here to kind of filter the list and then here we can actually go down because these are the, the whole data sets that are there. Um, but if we go down is for example here uh, a paper where the, the paper authors actually put their data online. So it says blood test using serum microRNAs can discriminate lung cancer from lung cancer, right? And how did they do that? Well, they have like 4,000 microarrays, so 4,000 humans which are done on microarrays, um, and you can just get the data, right? So you can just click on the link, go to the study that they did, and then here you see the Miame um, data that they have, right? So the, the Miame tells you that there has to be a title, you have to specify the organism, the type of experiment, you have to give a little summary, um, you give to have to give a little overall design, like circulating microRNAs of 3,924 samples, um, and then you describe how many uh, lung cancers there were, uh, so there were like 1,600 before the operation, there were 100 and 80 biops after operation and there are like 174 uh, 1700 control samples and when you look at it you can actually see that they so you can just click more and these are all of the samples and each of these links will give you a single microarray data set so hey, we can we can click on one of them and so you can see here that this was um, the sample identifier and so you can see that that this was done by some Japanese guys and this is the platform so you can get the annotation for the microarray and then um, here you see the hybridization protocol and all of the data that you have to provide from Miame. So and here you can see all of the different probes so it the probe names are of course not gene names because there's a microarray probe which targets a certain area in the genome and here you see all of the values so the expression values and so this is the the, the full table is very small it's only 62 kilobytes um, but hey, you can just get the original file from the FTP and you can just download it and then that's one sample and of course if you want to redo the experiment you download all of the samples in one go and then you can load it into R and then you can do things like do clustering or you can do like normalization. Um, so during the assignments we will we will use some microarray data not from GEO but from our own group um, so that you guys can look um, a little bit at how you can analyze microarray data and what you can do with it. Um, so 
this is for example a non-cancer control it was done from a female which was 56 year old and it is serum so it's just blood um, where they extracted RNA from so a very very useful site um, geo um, and a lot of people that I know that do bioinformatics use geo a lot to get samples for when they don't have money to do their own microarrays right because you if you if you just are interested in how highly is a certain gene expressed in for example brain and then you can do two things you can you can write a funding application get the money do the micro uh, microarrays yourself and then do the analysis to figure out if the gene is highly expressed or lowly expressed um, but in many cases, the first thing that you would do is go to GEO and see if there are samples which you might be able to use. And a lot of people that I know actually got really high impact publications from just using freely available data set, for example, from, from GEO. And so again, um, and you can just, this is the, the old data set browser. This is when you look at the curated part of GEO, so the gene expression omnibus. Um, and then you can see that, and you can see that, the, well, homo sapiens or mouse. And you can see which platform was used, which because you have different types of microarrays. Um, and then the series to which it belongs, which is the, the kind of experiment. And so here you see, for example, acute dengue patients, whole blood. So these were patients that were infected with dengue. They, so they just took blood samples and they have like 56 blood samples, which they put on a microarray. So if you're interested in how does dengue influence blood, you can just look into there and kind of look at it. And of course, you can also see their cluster analysis already. Um, nice. Um, that's going to be a ban. Uh, where's a ban? Ban, 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 ban. Right, good. Yeah, I was first. I was first. Moderator deleted the message. Thank you, moderator. Alright, so one of the other things that is also um, part of the gene expression atlas is BioGPS, um, and that will allow you to look at where a gene is expressed, so in which tissue is a gene expressed. Um, so this you can do via BioGPS. Um, so geo, oh yeah, the gene expression, on, sorry. So why do I show you gene expression? I, I, I forgot to put in a slide for array express, but gene expression omnibus um, is, is one of the databases. So you have two different databases, um, but there's some overlap and some samples are in both databases as well. So if you're interested in, in gene expression levels of a certain gene, um, you can also very quickly look at BioGPS, and BioGPS allows you to look at tissue-specific patterns. So here what they did is they downloaded all of the data from uh, GEO and from EBI, right? so from the two databases, and instead of looking at the microarrays, they looked at single genes across microarrays done in different tissue. Um, so you can, for example, have see if your favorite gene of interest is expressed in brain or if it's expressed in, in, in fat or in heart or in lungs. And you can see this also in different uh, individuals and different animals. Um, so ha um, we can take a quick look at the website. So let me open up the Firefox. Um, so this is, this is how it looks, very basic site, and for example, our favorite gene of interest here in our group is BBS7, um, which is a gene which is, we've found to be different in the Berlin fat mouse. So if we look at it, then we can see indeed that, yes, it has been measured in mouse, um, it's also been measured in humans and in rats, um, but if we just go to BBS7, and then we get this overview of all the different tissues, right? So we can see that this gene is actually highly expressed in, for example, the retina, so in, in the back of your eyes. Um, it is highly expressed in testis, and it is highly expressed in, in other, like, NIN 3T3 cells, um, but it is also relatively highly expressed in osteoblast. And so you can see very quickly where a gene is expressed. And so if you want to, for example, search for uh, myostatin, Right, so the, the, the gene which we just looked at, which controls the muscle growth, and then myostatin has also been measured in mouse, so we can just click on it, and then, hey, oh, no data set. So let's look at it in humans. 
So in humans, we can see that myostatin indeed is very highly expressed in cardiac myocytes, so in the heart. Um, we can see that it's uh, highly expressed in the supervisor cervical ganglion, but also highly expressed in skeletal muscle, which makes it a good candidate for mus muscle growth and muscle in inhibition. Right, and that's just some of the information that you can get out. Of course, the website provides much more. You can also drill down and look at which experiments were done. And one of the things is that myostatin apparently is also expressed in the adrenal cortex, so within the brain. Um, no idea why it would be expressed there. But and it's a really good website if you want to get a very quick overview in which tissue is my gene expressed. And so if you ever have to write a... a, 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 a for example, a PhD thesis, and your supervisor is a big gene of uh, FAT2, um, then head, the first thing that you do is you go to BioGPS, fill in FAT2, and then you can see where this gene is expressed. Um, so if it's expressed in brain or tissue, uh, or in, in lungs or in hearts or in, in, in anywhere. Not only do we have free microarray data and free microarray data measured across different tissues, we also have the sequence read archive of the NCBI. And this is the main storage database used in bioinformatics for all sequencing data. So if in the future you ever have to do a sequencing run um, and, you prov or, and you generate some sequencing data, um, then when you want to publish your paper, the journal will say to you, you have to put this data somewhere so that people can access it, so that they can redo your analysis. So sequencing data is stored in the sequence read archive. Um, it's a massive, massive website and they, they have literally like petabytes of sequencing data. And again, all freely available, you can, you can, well, almost all of it is freely available, some of it is still under uh, embargo, yeah, but if you're interested in, for example, for example, COVID, um, and you want to know everything about coronavirus and the different variants, and yeah, like which mutations are there in the Delta variant versus the Alpha variant, yeah, then you can get this information from the sequence read archive. So what they do is they provide data sets of sequencing runs um, done in, in, in humans, in mice, in plants, um, and not only DNA sequencing, but they also provide RNA sequencing. Um, so depending on if you wanna look at DNA level or if you wanna look at RNA expression level, um, you just go to the SRA, you search for whatever you're interested in and they will uh, show you what is available. Um, so. And of course, this is all to prevent people from spending money, spending money, spending money, and every time measuring the same thing, right? So if you've measured something, then you measure it once, you put it in the database so that other people can use it. So how does it look? Well, if you look, for example, for free sequencing data on the SRA, hey, you can, for example, say, well, I'm interested in COVID-19, you press search, and then it tells you that in total, there have been 142,000 COVID-19 samples sequenced and deposited in the sequence read archive. And this, of course, is an insane amount of money, especially if you realize that every sequencing run um, for a human genome is around a thousand to fifteen hundred euros. Of course, for something like a virus, it's much cheaper yeah, because the virus is much shorter, so you don't have to um, produce as many reads. Um, but again, like literally billions of dollars worth of data available for free, available for you to download and look at and do your own analysis on. All right, last part of the lecture. So I told you about ribozymes, right? And that RNA has catalytic activity as well. So, and of course, when we talk about the structure of RNA, we always talk about the primary structure, right? So the primary structure is just the ATU, uh, the AUCGs, so the order in which they occur. But of course, to have their function, and because you, you, generally want to look at the secondary structure or the tertiary structure, right? Because RNA molecules, they fall back on themselves and they function like a lock and key system. So the structure of the RNA molecule determines 
how active it is and what it does and then generally people talk about secondary structure so secondary structure is more or less a picture like this like I showed you with the anticodon arm and then when we talk about tertiary structure we are actually talking about the 3d structure so it's and it's not a flat representation of the base pairs and which base pairs connect to each other it is more or less the 3d structure that I showed you in my in my 3d viewer as well yeah, but these this is the thing yeah, so it looks like a clover leaf when you look at it in the secondary structure the tRNAs but if you look at it at the tertiary structure you see that it doesn't really look like a clover leaf it looks more like this like twisted up thing which has the has the, the the amino acid here right so the amino acid is here and then you have this T arm you have the the D arm and then you have the anticodon loop which is here so hey, it, it it looks very different in 3d than it does in 2d and 2d looks even different from like 1d which is just all the base pairs behind each other so of course one of the goals of bioinformatics is, is to make tools to predict the secondary and tertiary structure of RNA. Right? Because the, the, the structure determines what it does and if you know the structure then you can kind of infer the function of it. And you cannot really infer this function when you just look at the ACTGs. Right? So what the main goal is is then is to take the sequence either DNA or RNA and create a highly probable annotated group of secondary structures and this is generally done using low energy so we look at free energy of the structure because hey, it's always in water and so it folds upon itself and then it reaches a certain equilibrium which is the lowest energy state um, and then hey, what we want to do is predict a secondary structure and that can be done using different web web servers there's a lot of web servers available which allow you to just input your primary structure or your primary sequence and then does a prediction of a secondary structure and then it will annotate the secondary structures saying that well this part of your RNA protein might be binding DNA uh, this part might be protein binding right so you can kind of get an idea of what your RNA molecule is doing by just inputting it in one of these web tools and then seeing what the web tool says that which different domains there are right so this modular system can be used or can be exploited in a bioinformatics analysis to kind of up in each show predict what your RNA molecule might be doing it might be binding proteins might be doing conformational switches and stuff so I just wanted to show you the RNA fold web server because it's actually um, a pretty easy website to do um, so hey, of course this is how it looks like um, let me check if it still looks like this yeah, it still looks um, exactly like that. Um, so, hey, it's a very basic two-step process. You just paste your sequence um, or you upload a FASTA file if your sequence is too big. Um, you can choose different algorithms. So you can say, well, minimize the free energy and then do partitioning or minimize only the free energy. So that's not that important. On hey, If you want to learn more on how this works, they have a help file which actually explains all of the different algorithms and how they work. Um, what is important is that generally if you use big, if you do long non-coding RNAs, this takes a while. So fill in your email address and you will get a mail when the prediction is done um, instead of having to wait on the website for a couple of hours until it finishes the prediction. Um, so hey, RNA fold, one of these web servers which takes the primary RNA sequence and then predicts the secondary or tertiary structure and in this case it's the secondary structure that it predicts so I just wanted you guys to try it out right so um, when we when we think about SARS um, then hey, the, the, the SARS-CoV-2 virus has an envelope protein um, hey, and the protein of course works because it has a certain structure but of course the RNA coding for this envelope protein Right, which which the virus uses. So the RNA of the virus is by your own ribosome is producing this protein. Does this RNA have a certain structure? Right? Because that might be interesting. Because if this RNA is catalytic, uh, catalytically active, it might be that the RNA is actually doing the damage and not that the protein is doing the damage. Right? Because inside of the cell, hey, the RNA might be binding all kinds of important M messenger RNAs and degrading them or it might be causing damage to other proteins. Um, so hey, what we do is we, we just go to NCBI uh, to get, for example, the, um, the gene 
So we go to the gene because we want to get the RNA sequence of the SARS-CoV-2 envelope protein. Um, and we I chose the envelope protein because it's the smallest one, right? You could do the same thing for the spike protein, which everyone always talks about. Um, but I think that the envelope protein just works a lot better, right? So let's just click the link and just um, fill it in. Um, I actually think that I already did that. No, I didn't do that. So let me show you guys my Firefox window and then we go. So we say SARS-CoV-2 envelope protein. Uh, it takes a little while. It's a big database, so it searches through the whole database and then um, I think, yeah, all right, so there it is. So when we look at the output, it looks like this, right? So we see here that indeed have, we have the envelope protein and we see the envelope, we see the spike, we see the nucleocapside, we have the matrix, so the membrane glycoprotein, we have the uh, small envelope. Um, so let's just take the first one, right? So when we take the first one, um, we click here, uh, it will take a little while, so then it will give us some information, right? It will show where it is encoded into the virus, so you see that here is the spike protein, and then we have an open reading frame, so that codes for a protein that we don't know yet. Uh, we see the envelope, then we see the, 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 the other protein which also goes into the membrane, and then we see that there's another open reading frame, so another protein which codes for something. Here we can see the envelope itself, right? So we, it, it, it it also does a homopentameric prediction here, which we don't care about. We just want to get the sequence so we can do the structure prediction. So getting the sequence just means clicking the FASTA, right? Because FASTA is the format in which we transfer DNA or RNA code from one side to the other. So we just click the FASTA file, um, takes a little while, and then here we see the, the sequence, right? So we can just take it and we are going to take the description as well. So we're just going to copy it, we go to the RNA fold website, we just plug it in here, and then we just say proceed. Right, and then it, it just starts and does the prediction of the secondary and tertiary structure. This will take a while, and I didn't fill in my email address, but fortunately, um, ah, it's actually doing it quite fast. Oh, okay, it's already done, or is it not? So what it will give you is it will give you like a whole bunch of graphical output, um, but it will tell you that the RNA structure looks more or less like this, right? So you can see that it that it starts and it goes into kind of a circle with all of these, these pins. And then based on the color, the color tells you how likely it is that this is actually the structure. And here we can see that uh, the structure of it is uh, between zero being highly likely and one being being very unlikely to, to bind to each other. Um, so here we can look at the base pair probabilities. We can also look at the positional entropy. So base pair probabilities means how likely are two base pairs more or less binding each other. The positional entropy looks a little bit different because this is the this is the um, the likelihood that that two things are actually close to each other, which is different from binding. And you see when we look at the positional entropy, we already get more certainty. But if we look at the base pair probability, the only thing that the prediction is really certain of is that this part of the protein kind of looks like this. But it has no real idea of the other structure part. Um, so here is the one, and then we have a slightly different prediction as well, because this is the, the MFE secondary structure, then we have the centroid, so those are different prediction methodologies. Um, and then here we can also see the, um, the mountain plot, yeah, so this is the, the thermodynamic structure. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of information, and if you want to know exactly how everything works, you can read the paper here, and they will tell you exactly how they do their prediction and, and what the output exactly means. Um, but I, I just wanted to show you that it's relatively easy to do. Yeah, so we search, we get the sequence, we do the prediction, and then we get our results. Yeah, so you can see that indeed the base pair probability is relatively low, but we can see that it's relatively certain about the positional entropy, so where the different uh, things are located when you would put it in water. Yeah, so if we look at a tRNA prediction, we can see that it, when you do a tRNA, so a, a, a tRNA has a very specific structure because it, it needs to have this structure. And then you can see actually that here it is very certain about the structure. 
Yeah, the only thing that is not really certain about is this um, this part of the pro of, of the RNA molecule where the amino acid is attached. Yeah, but it is very certain about the t the b about the clover leaf structure that comes out. Well, compared to the yeah, here, you would say there's not a lot of structure. Like the the algorithm is not really able to determine what's going on and how this RNA molecule would look like when you when you look at the secondary structure. While here it is really certain about the secondary structure. Right, so the conclusion, if you would look at it, is say that there might be some structure to the RNA encoding for the envelope protein, but be aware that all of this, one of these structure prediction tools, and we will get back to it when we talk about protein, is that because you are asking the tool, give me a structure, it will find a structure. And that is also why it uses this color coding to kind of indicate how, how certain it is about the structure. But of course, since you are asking it, give me a structure, it will give you a structure because that's how these tools work. And so remember that RNA or messenger RNA or ribozymes, they are never a linear stretched out fragment like they are drawn when you are looking in textbook. And RNA functions because of its structure and because of its structure, it can have a catalytic activity and these structures are actually coming back in multiple RNA molecules and they have the same function when they have the same structure even if they are completely different RNA molecules and so it, it is a 3D molecule and RNA functions like a lock in a key so because it has a structure it fits into the lock and it can turn the key or, uh, because it has it, it's a key and it, it fits and it, it turns right so the structure is the thing that matters and not so much the sequence of course the sequence determines the structure in a way um, but then there's a the the, the 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 thing that it does it can only do because it has a certain structure so a word of advice and then we're done uh, don't blindly trust any prediction without experimental confirmation and have there is actually a really nice website from the University of Leipzig which has all of these tRNAs, so all of the 26 tRNAs which are available in humans and in mice and in other animals. It actually has um, validated structures for them. So hey, it's not just prediction, not just, but hey, there's also people that do, um, that do um, RNA structure and they measure RNA structure using x-ray crystallography so hey, there's also a lot of validated data about there and and don't blindly trust the prediction always see if there's any experimental confirmation and they they the University of Leipzig don't, doesn't only do tRNAs they also have other RNA molecules all right so that's it for today. I told you a little bit about the history of RNA. I told you about DNA versus RNA. So the differences, the five main differences being double-stranded, single-stranded, and the base pairs. Um, we talked about mRNA, uh, the different types of mRNA, which took up a large part of the lecture. So be aware that hnRNA is immature uh, messenger RNA that mRNA is mature messenger RNA, that snRNA is different from SNO RNA, right? snRNA um, does splicing, SNO RNA is involved in um, nucleolar RNA, is involved in the post-translational modification, right? So hey, there's, there's all types of different RNA um, and you need to kind of know what each type of RNA does. Um, we talked a little bit again about mRNA expression, that you can use microarrays and next generation sequencing and qPCR to measure the expression of genes. Um, we didn't really go into detail about the bioinformatics analysis, but that will be part of the assignment. Um, we talked about RNA sequencing a little bit, that it's actually the same as DNA sequencing with two additional steps, making your RNA into DNA and then just doing DNA sequencing. But I also showed you one of these examples from how you can use like the IGV to see what is different between these three different mouse strains and that one mouse strain has a deletion in the coding region making the protein non-functional while the other two mouse strains they had mutations in the five prime untranslated region which then regulate the expression of the gene so they still make a functional protein but they don't make enough of the protein um, i told you as well about free microRNA data and um, 
uh, about sequencing data so that you can get that from GEO or the short read archive and I told you guys about RNA structure prediction so how can you predict the structure of RNA using RNA fold and of course like these are only singular tools right there's there's literally probably 50 to 100 different tools which allow you to do RNA structure prediction both secondary as well as tertiary structure and all of these tools they have their advantages and drawbacks but I want to stress never blindly trust a prediction right a prediction is only an indication that this might be but always see if there's validation available so that people did um, like um, had real experiments like x-ray crystallography to make sure that the structure that you get is 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 real all right so not a very long lecture but i think a very difficult lecture in a way because there's all of these different types of rna and um uh, these kinds of things so a tipper thank you for following thank you thank you all right, so that's it for today. Um, I will stop the recording and um, then we're off. So people on YouTube, see you next time. Um, people on Moodle, see you next time. And bye-bye. Um,